Come on and put those hands together again. God praise for our music ministry. sitting by your neighbor for almost an hour. Just look over to him, tell him hi, give him a compliment, say something to him. Amen, amen. Let's wake up just a little bit. Praise God, we are not at a funeral. Amen, we are in the land of the living. Praise God. Yeah. Amen, since we're at church, you might as well act like we're at church. Amen, amen, amen. Or not, okay, great. Amen. Listen, before I come with the word, we want to be able to acknowledge and to celebrate Amen, one of our beautiful church mothers, and then to introduce, amen, some new church mothers here at the well. Amen. Help me celebrate Mother Carol Henry. Amen. She has a birthday on tomorrow. Come on up here, Mother Henry. I tell you, I tell people all the time, wherever I go, uh, that we have some amazing church mothers here at the well. I'm telling you, I have been a fan of church mothers ever since I was a little boy. I know I've told you all the story. I just give you a little snippet of it. Amen. Mother Sarah Elizabeth Dawson. Amen. At Faith Deliverance Church Baptist. I would sit with her. I would, the preacher would get ready to get up. Reverend Clark would get up to get ready to preach. I would look down that center aisle and Mother Dawson would look back at me and I would run. I would sit by Mother Dawson, sat with her every Sunday at church until she went home to be with the Lord. I fell in love with peppermints. I don't, I don't eat peppermints unless I'm in church. And when I eat peppermints, I think about Mother Dawson because out of all the candy in the world she could have, that's all she had in her purse was peppermint. She didn't have no Starburst. She didn't have no, no Skittles. She didn't have no Nihilators. All she had was peppermints. And she would give me a handful of peppermints. And I would just eat one and keep it in my mouth the whole time in church because I didn't like it. I didn't want to be disrespectful by spitting it out. But I fell in love. And I always said, whenever I grow up and have a big church, I'm going to have me some church mothers. And God answered my prayer and sent me some amazing church mothers here at the well. Mother Hemmer, we thank God for you. Uh, not just for another day, another year that God has given you to live, but for your dedicated service here to the well. Many years that you have served and served well, and we thank you for that, ma'am, and we thank God for you, and happy birthday, and we love you, and guess what? Ain't nothing you can do about it, ma'am. have to get people their flowers while they can smell them. Amen. That way you don't have to get to their funeral and start lying. Amen. But you can tell the truth. Amen. While they are alive. I'm excited. Amen. To be able to welcome uh, Mother Moodry. Amen. Send a Mother Moodry so they can see you. Amen. One of our new church mothers. And Mother Malone. Amen. That's also one of our new church mothers. Two amazing ladies that have just demonstrated commitment to God and committed commitment to the world. So I'm excited to have them as a part of the mothers here at the world. Come on, let's give God praise once again. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Luke 23. Luke 23. And just one verse. Luke 23, verse 34. Luke 23. And 34, to all of our elders and ministers, our deacons, our mothers, to all of God's people, we thank God for another opportunity to be here in the land of the living. Amen. Every time we get an opportunity to tell God, thank you, man, we ought to do it. Whenever we get an opportunity to be able to praise God, we ought to do it. I mean, we ought to leave church exhausted from giving God all that we got. Because you never know, the day that we live in now, it could be your last time. And if you were to close your eyes on this side and wake up on the other side, you want to say that I went out as a praiser, worshiping and praising God for all that he has done. Luke 23 and 34. When you have it, say amen. If you don't, just say, wait on me, wait on me, wait on me. Luke 23 and 34. So on the screens, if you don't have it, and it reads as follows. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, 
for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Father, we thank you. God, we praise you. God, we glorify you. God, we magnify you. And God, we lift you up. Because you are God and you are God all by yourself. Father, I ask that you hide me behind the cross. Less of me and more of you. Preach through, preach through me, oh God, so that your people will be blessed by your word, that lives be transformed by the preaching and the teaching of your word, God. And as we're on this road to Calvary to celebrate the resurrection, God, we thank you that, yes, you died and you rose again, but thank you that even from the cross, you had lessons for us to be able to grasp and to understand and to receive. Thank you for the sacrifice that you did for us that we may have the right to eternal and everlasting life. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray and all of God's people said, touch three people around you as you go into your seat and just say, neighbor, let it go. Let it go. Just find you three people and just tell them, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Wayne Grudem, the author of Systematic Theology, paints the agonizing portrait of our Savior's horrific death. When crucified, Christ was forced to endure a slow death by suffocation. Brought on by the weight of his own body, he was stretched out and fastened by nails to a rugged cross. His arms supported most of his weight. His chest cavity was pulled upward and outward, making it difficult to exhale, exhale and then draw in fresh breath. To breathe, picture this you all, he had to push up on his legs putting all the weight on the nails through his feet and pull up on the nails through his hands, sending fiery pain through the nerves of his arms and his leg. His back, already been whipped raw, scraped against the rough, splinter-filled wooden cross with each breath he took. But the physical pain was nothing compared to the spiritual pain. Jesus, who knew no sin, who never sinned, Jesus hated sin, yet Jesus voluntarily took upon himself all the sins of those who would one day be saved. He bore the sins of many, echo the prophet Isaiah, which, that which he hated with his whole being poured out upon him. And it was while Jesus was on this old rugged cross that he echoes the words as he stands between two criminals. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus who was innocent Never committed any type of sin. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. But the pressure of the crowd made Pilate suggest that Jesus be crucified and die. We love celebrating Easter because we celebrate the fact that we have new life. Jesus died. He rose again. He got up with all power in his hands. The old preachers would say that he went down to hell, had a revival, came back with the keys with all power in his hands. That's great. That's good. But there's some things that happened before the grave. There's lessons from the cross that Jesus echoes as, uh, uh, almost as if there's last words that he wanted to be able to share with us before he takes his last breath. All right, tell us. So the first lesson that Jesus shares with us here mm -hmm. is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. 
Now this blows my mind, this blows my mind, this blows my mind because Jesus, as humble as he is, he shows that he is the ultimate example of what a believer of Jesus Christ should be. What I love so much about Christ is that he never just tells us how we should behave and how we should conduct ourselves, but he has demonstrated through everything that he's done, he has demonstrated in good times, in bad times, what Christian conduct and what Christian character really is. All right. Jesus here, please hear me this morning. Jesus here on the cross calls out to his father and petition and intercedes on behalf of people who have done him wrong when, 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 when all he had to do was open up his mouth a little bit louder and his father would have sent angels, his father would have sent help to come and take out everybody there. <laughs> that had put him on that cross. He could be mad. He could be angry. He could be bitter. He could go for revenge. But Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus introduced this lesson for us to help us to know how to deal with forgiveness and how to be able to forgive. Why, why, Pastor, why does Jesus share this with us? Because he knew that he knew, he knew, he knew, he knew that he had to be the example of what real forgiveness looks right. like right. so that his sons and daughters could be able to mimic and to do not just what he said, but to act out how he lived. Let's jump right into it. Forgiveness. I love what Pastor Tony Evans says. Tony Evans says this. He says, forgiveness is a decision of your will to no longer charge the offense to the offender's account. It's the decision to release the other person from a debt in spite of how you feel. Oh, I'm going to read that one more time. Let me, let me set this air real straight so that you can get comfortable, amen, and enjoy this good word this morning. Here it is. Let me read it again. Okay. Forgiveness uh -huh. is a decision of your will to no longer charge the offense to the offender's account. It's a decision to release the other person from a debt in spite of how you Feel. Here it is, thanks to God. Let me help us out real quick because there are people in this room right now that is battling with forgiving someone for what they've done. There are people in this room right now, don't say nothing, just look at the cross. Amen, just look at the cross. There are people in this room right now, you are struggling with family members. You are struggling with the spouse. You're struggling with kids. You're struggling with siblings. You're struggling with friends. You're struggling. All right. With forgiving someone for what they have done to you. And I'm not talking about what they may have done or said yesterday or what they may have done and said last night. But years ago that you are still charging their account for what they have done. You thought that you were over. You thought that you were past them. My goodness. As soon as you saw them, as soon as there was something that reminded you of them, that it sent you right on back down that road again. And all the feelings that you had before, all the thoughts that you had before, it all comes back and it's so fresh because you haven't forgotten nothing at all. Oh, you love Christ. You love Jesus. Oh, you love, I love God. Yes, I love God. What's wrong with you? I love him. You love him. You love him. You love him. But you struggle with forgiving. Let's go ahead. Let's not, let's not be churchy. We know what the Bible says. We know that the Bible says that if we have an issue with forgiving others in Christ, we'll have a problem with forgiving us, that it will be challenging for him to be able to forgive us whom, whom, whom we have never seen him, but we have an issue with forgiving our brothers and our sisters whom we see every day. We understand that part. We understand the principle of forgiveness. We understand that we should forgive, but it's still a struggle. I wish I had a real church here right. this morning. It's still yet a struggle to let go and to release. 
here it is. I know, I know, I know, but he, he, here's what we do. Here's what we do. Here's what we do. We say that we have forgiven, and we say that we are not bothered by it. We say that we are beyond it. We say that we are done with it, but when, in, in, in essence, we're really not because we are failing to confront the issue that we have with what the person has done to us and how they have hurt us. And so what do we do in order to be able to protect ourselves so we don't get hurt again? We ignore the pain. All right. All right. We ignore the damage that has been done and act as if nothing has ever happened. And we keep telling ourselves if I act as if nothing has happened, Greta, then I've really forgiven them. We tell ourselves, if I don't acknowledge the hurt and the pains that they cause me, I'm okay. I'm okay. If I just go on, I want to be a good believer, I want to be a good Christian, and just say I have forgiven them and give them a pat on the back and give them a high five, yippee yo yay, and go on about my day. But it's not just that simple, right. saints. It's not that simple. Oh, if we are really going to walk in the forgiveness that Jesus desires for us to be able to walk in. Here it is. Here it is. Real simple. Feel the hurt and feel the pain. All right. Allow yourself to feel the hurt and the pain that was caused by the accused. Allow yourself right. to be okay mm -hmm. with not being okay. To be all right with not being all right. Because trying to ignore it, trying to say that it, is not, that it didn't hurt, all you're doing is lying to yourself. That's right. And trying to coach yourself into believing something that's not even a real reality. You're right. The Christian thing, the churchy thing that we want to do is, oh, I want to forgive them, and then I want to reconcile, and we can go right back to being friends. Here it is. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Pump your brace real quick. When someone has hurt you, when someone has abused you, when someone has taken advantage of you, when someone has someone that you trusted that has broken that trust. It is not the Christian thing right away to be able to restore them back into your life. Mm -hmm. Teach. There's no point in having restoration if there has never been forgiveness first. Right. Forgiveness right. says, I like what Pastor John Faison says. I love what he says. He says, forgiveness says that I relinquish the right flesh to get you back. But restoration says, restoration says that I will now put you back into a certain space in my life. But before I put you back in that certain space in my life, I have to acknowledge the fact that what you've done, what you've said, how you behave, it has hurt me and it has caused me pain. We have to learn as, be as believers of Jesus Christ how to, I know this is another curse word right here, a new one for 2019. We have to learn how to communicate how we feel. All right, all right. Oh, man, I know, I know. Pastor, I don't want to hear about that. I want to hear about how I have a destiny. I want to hear about how I have a purpose. I want to hear about how I'm going to turn around five times. I'm going to be a millionaire by the end of the year. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I wish I could say that, but I would be in trouble with my father if I said that to you because I don't know if that's the truth or not. But what I can tell you all is right, that on. you and I have to get better. We are emotional beings, and we have to do a better job at communicating how we feel if you have hurt me if you have offended me I need to be mature enough after I've calmed down and won't use curse words I have to be mature enough all right you're telling the truth to come to you and express to you how I feel I have to be mature enough and grown enough to be able to come and say what you said, what you did, it hurt me. I know it may not have been your intention, or this very realm may have been your intention, but it hurt me, and I need you to know that it hurt. Because me ignoring that it hurt is causing me to hurt more. All right. And me not coming to you and sharing with you about the pain that you may have caused me is causing me to hurt even more. And so when I have not been healed in this area in my life, now I go forth and now my relationships are tainted. 
because of an issue that I've had with you, but I've never cleared that issue and expressed to you about that issue. Now all my other relationships are tainted because I've never dealt with that one issue. Help us, God. Oh, man, I know I'm talking good in here this talking morning. Good. I know it. I know it. It's tight, but my God is right. It's really tight, but it's right. Just hold, just look at the cross, look at the cross, look at the cross. If, if we never get to a place that we don't know, that we don't learn how to communicate how we feel, we will be emotionally damaged. Teach. And everything connected to us will become emotionally damaged. We won't know what a healthy relationship will look like because we don't know how to communicate our feelings. That's right. And when I, know how, when I don't know how to communi communicate my feelings and express of what's going on in my heart, that's why sometimes if I can't get it out with my words, I have to write a letter to God and help me to be able... All right. Be able to get out how I feel. Because if I don't, it will torment me on the inside. Yeah. Preach. Preach. And will cause for my other relationships to be damaged. You can forgive a person. Love them with the love of Jesus. But it doesn't mean that they have to be restored back into your life. Here it is, here it is, here it is. That's why you and I have to have discernment and have a close walk and relationship with Christ so that Jesus can be able to dictate to us who needs to be restored back and who needs to stay at the level that they're at. All right. Oh, man, it's tight in here, but we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. It's, it is a decision of your will to no longer charge the offense to the offender's account. It is a decision to release the other person from the dead. In spite of how you feel, forgiveness is not based on how you feel. It has to be a decision that you make that I'm going to let you go because you are living in my mind, in my heart, and in my emotions. Rent free. Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. It's interesting to me that as Jesus is giving this first lesson from the cross about forgiveness, it's interesting to me that Jesus shows us something here. Here it is, saints of God. Here it is. Forgiveness is impossible without the help of God. Jesus realized I'm here on this old rugged cross. I, my back is raw. I'm in excruciating pain. And I realized those that are around me, some of these jokers knew exactly what they were doing. They knew what they were doing as they're down there playing dice for my clothes. They knew exactly what they were doing. But Jesus says, Father, I need you to help me to forgive them. Yes, yes. For they know not. What they're doing. Here it is, saints of God. I, I got to mess with you this morning. Some of us, some of us, some of us stay stuck in the hallway of unforgiveness because we choose not to ask God to help us to forgive. Oh, God. We stay in the hallway of unforgiveness because we know that there is help. Get this. We know if we ask God to help us to forgive, he'll do it. But we consider it a badge of honor to carry... This debt that somebody else has towards us. Jesus says, it's impossible to forgive others without the help of God. It takes God to help us to be able to forgive. It takes God to help us to look over what someone has done. It takes God to erase the words that have, may have damaged our lives yes. for decades. It takes God to help us to let go of what they may have said and what they may have done. It takes God to help us to forgive someone yes. that has abandoned us.
And I want to help us today that don't stay, don't stay, don't linger in that hallway of unforgiveness no more. Don't allow, don't allow another week that you stay in the hallway of unforgiveness because you are comfortable there and you want to dangle something and hold something over somebody else's head. When God is able to help you to be able to forgive our Father who is love, our Father who yes. has demonstrated forgiveness towards us will help us and condition our hearts to forgive others that have wronged us. Amen. Jesus realizes that. Father, forgive them. Father, intercede. Jesus begins to pray for his enemies as he's on the cross that they put him on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But Jesus shows us something else. I'm almost done, y'all, for real. I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to push you or shout you today, really not, because uh, I don't think you would do it anyway. But here it is, here it, here's what he says. Here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. We're more amped to forgive when there is a trust, a consistent trust in God in times of trouble. Here it is. To trust God in times of trouble takes consistent intimacy. Okay. Otherwise, we'll run. Okay, okay. All I told right. you all, I'm not preaching and teaching for where we are. I'm preaching and teaching for where we're going, for where God wants to take us. And so it's the word that dictates us, that dictates that and directs us. So here it is, here it is, here it is. Pastor Jones, what do you mean by that? That doesn't make sense to me. It means this, that I will have trouble forgiving God, forgiving others. Okay. If I only allow Sundays to be my day where I'm intimate with God. Oh, God, I just said something. All right. If I'm dictating how I'm able to forgive off of my church attendance when the national stats say that the average church attendance is two Sundays a month, mm. I'm never going to be able to forgive because I won't be at church to receive the word right. to help me to be able to forgive. But when I am walking in an intimate relationship with Christ, a consistent relationship with Christ, when I am connected to the vine where I'm in his word, thank you, Elder James, where I'm in his word, where I'm in worship, where I'm in prayer, he conditions my heart. And when my heart wants to do its own thing, that word will rise up and say the same way I have forgiven you. It's the same way that you must extend that forgiveness to somebody else so I gotta I gotta I gotta we, 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 I, 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 I gotta be able to walk consistently with God I gotta yeah. talk to God all the time one of the things about pastoring um, that people fail to realize that pastors they will never say we'll never say it, but we get hurt a lot of times by things that people do and things that people say and our job is to never use the pulpit to be able to throw daggers to be able to get people back all oh, but we have to find a secret place to be able to talk to God and tell God all about it so I can keep walking with him and keep loving. Keep walking with him and keep preaching. Keep walking with him and keep teaching and preaching his word. I can't allow anything to interrupt my walk with God. Wow, because it's my intimate relationship with Christ that helps me not to curse you out. Oh, God, it's my walk with Christ. It's my walk with Christ that keeps my hand back from laying hands on you and then praying that God raises you up. It is my walk with God that helps me not to put you on blast on social media when I got a whole bunch of stuff to use. It is my walk with Christ that it helps me to be able to forgive when I don't want to forgive. And somebody ought to stand up and say, God, I thank you for the Holy Ghost that it helps me to do what I want to do. That it helps me to take the upper road and not the same road. It is my relationship with Christ. Because here it is. Why are you putting all your junk out there on social media to get you a journal, get you a best friend, and get you a therapist? And find you a secret place with God. 
find you a closet and lock yourself in that closet and begin to pour your heart out to God. God, this hurt like hell. God, they did this. God, I, 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 and I mean name names. Put their names out there. God, she did this. He did that. They did that. God, and I need you to help me heal. And to be able to forgive. To make the decision that I'm releasing you from the debt. I'm relinquishing the right to take revenge. And I'm choosing to take the upper road instead of your road. Forgiveness. Yes. Takes a close. Notice everybody say consistent. A consistent walk with God of intimacy, 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 a, a consistent walk of intimacy. That's why it hurt Jesus so bad. It hurt him so bad, even though he knew what his assignment was and what he had to do. It hurt him so bad because he had never done anything to disappoint his father. He had never sinned. Then no sin. And he knew that taking on the punishment that for me to bore the sins of the world would mean that my father would turn his back on me. Mm. So the physical pain that Jesus experienced on the cross was nothing compared to the, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the spiritual pain that he experienced. Knowing that there was a separation, a gap between him and his father. The intimacy of the relationship being broken hurt him more than being on the cross. Why? Because he realized everything that I need to be effective in life and in ministry is connected to the vine. He realized that everything that I need to be consistent in life and in ministry is predicated and is dictated through my personal, intimate, consistent walk with Christ. Here it is, sense of God. I know I've been saying this a lot, but I need you all to get it because we haven't gotten all the way there yet. There has to be a consistent time of intimacy that we have with God in our relationship with him. Because it's when we're in the word, it's when we're in prayer, it's when we're in worship, when he will arrest our hearts and condition our heart to do what pleases him. That's why forgiveness is not, is not about how you feel because you don't feel like forgiving them. Right. You feel like they don't deserve forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus. But I have to make the decision that regardless of how I feel, I must release them from the dead. Why? Not so much for them, but for me, so that I can be able to move on. But my life, here it is, here it is. I tell you, I'm almost done. Here it is. The same mercy and grace that we desire from Jesus is the same mercy and grace we are to extend to others. Same mercy, same grace we ask of Jesus is the same mercy and the same grace we are to extend to others. The way that we shout on first Sundays when we take communion because of his grace and his mercy and what that has done for us is the same grace and the same mercy that we are to extend to others. Y'all don't believe me? Go to Matthew chapter 18 because y'all looking at me real strange. And I told you I don't like when you do that. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Here it is. Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Jesus was the greatest storyteller ever. He was always using stories, parables, to be able to get people's attention to understand his message. Here it is. I'm going to read it to you. Chapter 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Verse 23. 
Therefore, 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 the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who has decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who have borrowed money from him. Verse 24, in the process, or in the process, one of his debtors brought in one brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, children, and everything that he owned to pay the debt up, to pay the debt. Verse 26, but the man fell down before his master, begged him, please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay it. He fleeted, but his creditor couldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that, that had happened. Then the king called the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant. I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you? Have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you. Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father would do to you if you refused to give your brothers and sisters from the heart. Oh, here's a lesson. Here's a lesson. Jesus says, you begged me. And you pleaded with me for grace and mercy. Mm. I gave it to you. I didn't withhold it from you. I didn't dangle it in front of you. I gave it when you asked for it. But yeah. the same one who has been forgiven now has a problem with forgiveness. How can anybody that has experienced grace. the grace yes. and the mercy of God free of cost. Slate, white clean. How could any individual that has experienced that turn away from that and have a problem with forgiving? Jesus says, yes. the same grace, the same mercy that I've given you is the same grace and the same mercy that you are to extend to others. A conscious decision that you and I have to make. I don't have to restore everybody, but I need to forgive. Amen. All right. You've broken my trust. I know how much, I know how far to go with you now, but I need to forgive you and move it on and move on with my life and release you from this debt. I don't have to bring you back in my life. We don't have to be best friends. You don't have to eat dinner with me, but I have to forgive you yes. to release you from the debt. Why? Because my father has forgiven me of much, oh my gosh, if I could just pass the mic around, we wouldn't even have enough mics in the building to be able to testify about all the things that God has forgiven us. Oh my goodness, if you knew what your brother or your sister that you sit next to has been forgiven from, you wouldn't even want to sit next to them because you would realize they nasty. But when I have experienced the real, uncut, raw, raw version of grace and mercy for my Savior. I have to extend it to whoever I come in contact with. That's a challenge for us today. If Jesus at one of the most despairing moments of his life could say, Father, could look down from that cross and pray 
for people who are getting ready to take his life, watching him die. If he's able to forgive, saints of God, we don't have an option. Here it is. Oh, you ain't going to like this because we, we like options. Forgiveness is not an option. It's a command. You don't get a choice. You don't get a choice in the matter. If you should forgive, or oh, who should receive your forgiveness? No, we're called to forgive. And when we have trouble with forgiving, we ask our Heavenly Father, Father, help me. I don't want to forgive them. They're not worthy of my forgiveness. But neither was I when you forgave me. So God, help me to forgive them. Help me. In the Greek, it means to send away. Help me to send it away. To release them. Because I'll tell you the most painful thing is this. Is that when you struggle with forgiving somebody and they moved on with their life and here you are stuck in the prison in your mind because you can't let go of what was done. Years of your life that have been taken away. And because I've never communicated to them what they've done, they don't, they don't even know that they hurt me. And they live in their best life. And here I am, tormented every day. Can't eat. Can't sleep, can't focus. Years of this. When all you got to do is make the decision today. I choose to forgive when I should get revenge. I choose to forgive. When I could keep charging your account, I choose to forgive. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. Well, Pastor, I hear you. And I want to do it. Choosing not to forgive and walking in unforgiveness will make you a candidate for anger, bitterness, and revenge. Because I told you, it's a choice. You can choose to release the debt, or you can choose to lock yourself in a prison that you have the key to, and be tormented in your emotions with anger, with bitterness, and with revenge. Miss Lynn, which will make it hard to be in any healthy relationship. Because I got anger. I got bitterness. And I got revenge on my mind. How about one second, Sister Greg? The decision and the choice is yours today. I'm, 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 I'm closing with this, and I want, you, I, I want you to ask yourself the question. Closing with this. Whose debt do you need help canceling today? What individual, what person do you need to release today so that you can be able to be free. Who do you need to forgive? So that you can be free in your heart. Walking around angry. Walking around bitter. Walking around revengeful. 
It's not going to help you. It's, it's all, it's all, it's all, it's all a trap of the enemy. To get you into thinking, oh, the more mad I be, the more mad I am, it's going to help the problem. No. It's taken away from you. Who do you need to release today? Who do you need to go and confront? Who do you need to write a letter to? Who do you need to set up a meeting with and say, hey, I'm free from you today. I'm telling you, one of, one of the most powerful scenes, one of the, one of the most powerful scenes of, uh, 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 of any movie is in color purple when Miss Celia is at that table. Miss <laughs> Sophia done came home, they're sitting around the table, they're eating real good. Mr. said the wrong thing and she just had enough and she, 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 she hits that table. And she tells Mr. about himself. She said, man, listen, you know what? You know what? Those kids would have been about something if you had raised them. And she told her heart, bro, listen, the white folks wouldn't even get to uh, Sophia if you hadn't been trying to have control over her. And she just went off on him. Mr. thought he still had her. Sit up. He said, you're ugly. You're a woman. You ain't got nothing. Ain't never been nothing. And Celia gets up. She says, any more letters came? Because she knew letters had came. She ain't been getting them. By this time, she had been going off into the secret place and reading the letters with Suge Avery. She was at that table. Getting ready to go with Suge. He said, Suge can sing. Sugar got talent. So you're young, you're black, you're ugly. That day was Miss Seely's day of release. Y'all know what she said? She got in the back of that car. She said, everything you've done to me has already been done to you. She said, I may be black, I may be ugly, but by God, I'm still here. That was her day of letting Mr. know that you're no longer controlling my emotions. You're no longer controlling my life. Because I've released you. And something empowers you by seeing that scene. But let me tell you something. That's something that you can be able to live in your own life right now. And releasing and letting go. So that you can move on with your life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me pray with you. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus. God, I pray right now for every individual in this room right now, Father God, that has trouble with forgiving, God. We it's not as easy as it seems to be. But God, I'm thankful that you are able and that you are willing to help us, God. I pray that you would give us hearts, Lord God, that want to forgive, Lord God. Give us the will and the, uh, give us the will to forgive, Father God, that we're not basing it off of how we feel, Father God, but that we will extend the same grace and the same mercy, oh God, that you have given us that we would give it to others freely with no charge no strings attached that we would just forgive and I pray Father God that we won't become Lord God that we won't get to the place oh God where we're just blocking everybody Father God but that you would give us discernment to know who stays and who goes who's restored and who do I need to keep at a good distance so we need your wisdom father we can't do this without you we need your help we need your guidance we need your direction father help us to be able to communicate how we feel God help us Lord that we won't go all around the world and tell the others about what a person has done and never confront them 
So I pray for spiritual maturity. I pray for courage. I pray for grace. I pray for boldness. To do what we need to do, Father. God, we thank you. God, we praise you. God, we glorify you. And we lift you up. And it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. And all of God's people said, come on and put those hands together. Give God praise.